This is Duke University. This week on Office Hours, it's not just Shakespeare and Faulkner that can be analyzed critically. Everyday images can also be read using literary tools, according to Wanima Lubiano, an associate professor of literature at Duke. Lubiano takes your questions on the extensive toolkit and the relationship between literature and Marxist theory. Hello, this is Camille with the Duke News Office. Today we're going to talk about literature and the literary tools that can be used to find meaning in everyday life. Literature opens us up to a constellation of meanings. I borrowed that term from our guest today, Professor Juanima Lubiano. Hi, Camille. Hi, welcome. Thank you. So I have a very basic question to okay. ask you first. Okay. What is the difference between English and literature? The English department is organized around the study of literature as its object. So literature could mean books, novels, plays, that sort of thing. The literature program at Duke is not organized specifically around literary text, but around social text, around a multiplicity of kinds of text. So we could be attending to discourses around of the idea of education in public schools. We could be attending to the thought of, of Marx, in, both in the moment of Marx's circulation of his work and in the present. We could be talking about particular philosophers. Well, I like so. the idea that you mm -hmm. have of um, bus schedules because that's mm -hmm. something everyone can relate yeah. to. So tell me, what would literature do with a bus schedule? Well, it, I came up with that because my students wanted to be able to explain to their parents what the literature program was about that was different from the English department. And I said, all right, if we think of literature as a literature program as a collection of scholars and a collection of research interests, those research interests themselves were built on particular theories. So we could take some of those theories and we could look at the mundane, the everyday. I'm a cultural studies scholar, and cultural studies is a way of producing meaning or looking at the way meaning is produced and circulated through cultural practices in the everyday world. So a bus schedule doesn't get much more every, every day, right? Mm -hmm. A bus schedule then allows us to consider how it is that people make sense of something. What do you need to know in order to make sense of a bus schedule? Now, we forget the basics. Well, you need to know what time is, mm -hmm. what durations of time mean. Where it's going. You need to be able to think about where it's going, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And how one gets to where one's going. You need to be able to think about what it means to get up on a vehicle and walk to a certain part of the vehicle. Now, these are simple, everyday things, but they're only simple because we already know it. So looking at a bus schedule and asking these kinds of questions helps us begin to see how we know something because we think about what we need to know in order for that thing to have meaning. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned something earlier about cultural studies. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. how is that, what, what is cultural studies in relation to African American studies and women's studies? Yeah, and I've argued actually that there are different names for the same kind of work. So if we think of cultural studies as a study of how meaning is produced and circulated, then black American studies has been about how meaning is produced and circulated about black Americans. I okay? see, right. And the reason I say I'm a cultural studies scholar is because cultural studies now is itself such a massive field, such an enormous undertaking, that people sometimes recognize what you do more when you refer to that than when you refer to, say, African American studies. African American studies, in most people's minds, is just about the group. African Americans. So I use cultural studies as a way to open up how we can say many, many, many things about the group, even without necessarily focusing on individuals in the group. Got you. So, um, so the, when you were talking about a bus schedule and mm -hmm. all of the, the mm -hmm. ways you can look at a bus schedule, this can also be applied to a presidential speech. Yes. And we have um, a clip of President Obama speaking to the Congressional Black Caucus okay. a couple weeks ago. Okay. Um, and I think you can have fun with this. Okay. So I don't know about you, CBC, but the future rewards those who press on. With patient and firm determination, I'm going to press on for jobs. I'm going to press on for equality. I'm going to press on for the sake of our children. I'm going to press on for the sake of all those families who are struggling right now. 
I don't have time to feel sorry for myself. I don't have time to complain. I'm going to press on. I expect all of you to march with me and press on. Take off your bedroom slippers. Put on your marching shoes. Shake it off. Stop complaining. Stop grumbling. Stop crying. We are going to press on. We've got work to do. CBC, God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Okay, okay, so take that, off your right. bedroom it's, slippers. It's fascinating, but even before he gets to the bedroom slippers, uh -huh. because that's at the very end of the speech, and I read the transcript of the speech online, and what's, there are some things that were absolutely so fascinating that now I understand how they give the proper build-up to, did you pay attention to the tone of when he says, press on? Yes. Press on, yes. right? It's not the way he generally says and those particular words, right? Right. 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 right? right. So he does it in the very beginning of the speech when he starts talking about his relationship with Reverend Lowry. I mean, in the transcript, you can see it more clearly. And after he introduces Reverend Lowry, of course, to an audience who already knows quite well mm -hmm. who Reverend Lowry is, he goes on to establish his connection with Reverend Lowry. A few years later, Dr. Lowry and I were together at Brown Chapel AME Church, right? So he's now brought in not just the civil rights movement, not just Lowry's place in it, but Brown Chapel AME Church. And for a black audience, and the Congressional Black Caucus is a largely black audience, all of that resonates in different ways. You've got the weight of history, the weight of political struggle, and the reminder that in many ways black Americans are a churched people. But it's more than that. It's a signal then that church dial is going to creep into this. So you have the civil rights movement that establishes big history and Lowry that establishes individual written into big history and then the church as a signal that, and now I'm moving into the rhetorical space that you all recognize. You know what the space is like. And he, as he's going through this, you think, okay, the extraordinary language and his, his facility with language is not only holding these things together all the time, but it's also reminding us that what he's talking about has the same importance as the sacred. Because you evoke church and Christianity in order to say, Sacred knowledge is on my side. God is on my side. God is on your side. Uh -huh. And all of you have been in enough congregations to know that the only proper response to that is, amen, yes, this is a righteous struggle. Oh, I see. So here's Obama, head of the U.S. state, talking about a jobs bill and blessing, so to speak that work with all of these other things that we already know how to revere. And that's important because he taps on what we already know, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. We don't have to learn all of this in that moment. Right. And he does this throughout, throughout the speech. And it, when he gets finally to this march on, right, that's the cadence of the civil rights movement, but it's also the cadence of the church. My father was an AME minister. My stepfather was an AME minister. I grew up in the church, so mm -hmm. I recognize the sounds and the cadences. I'm not a believer, but I recognize it. And there's a part of me that feels feels myself pulled into it. And he's counting on that. And the audience is counting on it because they've already agreed to the implicit social contract here. We're not just talking about ourselves. We're talking about our history. And we're talking about the inevitable righteousness of our struggle. So by the time he actually says, take off your bedroom slippers, he's right there in the middle of the way a preacher exhorts his con congregation. The preacher doesn't really mean that they're hanging around being slackers in their bedroom slippers sitting on the couch watching TV. No, it's the way that the preacher reminds you, you now have to gear yourself up for the righteous struggle. And you do it in these homey terms, right? You don't leave the everyday behind in order to say, I am now staying within the terms of our sacred understandings, our church understandings, you say, no, these things all live together. Mm -hmm. We're all sitting here, mm -hmm. and sometimes we sit here in our figurative bedroom slippers, and now I'm reminding you that we've moved out of that, and we've moved on to the serious business. And when he keeps saying, press on, mm -hmm. press on, you know, the way, I'm not even sure that I can do it. Mm -hmm. The way that he does it, it's, more important than the actual words is the jolt to our memory of other occasions when we heard somebody say, we got to press on. 
Wow. So this is important. This historical referencing, this is the work of literature. This is what it's literature to does. To think about that. Yeah. So when I'm with my students, they're saying, well, when you ask us to close read, what do you mean? And I said, what I want you to do is move past the immediate impact of the words. Mm -hmm. Don't take the words for granted. None of these words are accidental choices. Mm -hmm. A great deal of thought went into this. Mm -hmm. And the ideas that I'm talking about, I'm bringing to the, them to the foreground, but it's because I've frozen this moment mm -hmm. enough so that we can look at it closely. Your brain is already doing that. My mm -hmm. students are fascinating. They're saying, well, is this just something you learned to do? And I said, you're already doing it. Right. You just don't know that you're doing right. it because you're listening and you're processing this so fast. Uh -huh. You're not even aware of the wealth of information that you're already bringing to this encounter. So people don't really always know what, what right. it is that they right. know. So in many ways, I'm describing what is always already going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, we went out this week um, mm -hmm. to speak with some people on campus mm -hmm. about what it is that they think they know, and that's what we asked them. What, is, what wow. subject do you know a lot about? Mm -hmm. I know a lot about games to help third graders learn English when they Spanish is their native language. I know a lot about like the Israel side of Middle East politics because like I have a lot of family from Israel, so um, sometimes I find that like it's a little biased, but I'm like pretty passionate about it. And right now it's patho, so I know the process of atherosclerosis and how it can lead to myocardial infarction. I would say food. I'd say food. The reason being, at Duke over here, like we have uh, in the past four years, we've accum accumulated a lot of pounds, freshman 15 and onward. Well, that's a range of right. uh, subjects that they think right. they know about. And it, what's interesting, if, we, if I was to do this in the classroom, I would talk about the discourses that come together. So my students ask me, so what is a discourse? Right. And the easiest way to think about a discourse is to think about it as an extended conversation, more or less elaborated, it just depends. But it's all the things that you need to know in order to make sense of something. So the last speaker, I think, referred to food, food right? right? So that's a discourse in and of itself, and it's massive. Yeah. And it's, it's apparent sometimes in simple forms. I prefer to eat cereal for breakfast, right? But you can elaborate what cereal and the preference for cereal means. Where did the preference for cereal come from? This past week, I think in the New York Times magazine, they were looking at different breakfasts over different decades, different periods of time, and what breakfast looked like in the, in the early 19th century, what it looked like in the late 19th century, what happens in the moment when we move to cereals, right? So then I say, to some extent, whether he knows it or not, he's participating in the building of an elaborated discourse around, around food, but also around what we bring to food, how food comes to be before us, what we do with food. When people talk about sports, right, that incredibly elaborated discourse. And I've had fun talking about sports because I don't know anything about them. Yeah. But I grew up with five brothers, and I love to say things like, football's just dumb. You're just kicking a ball oh. the way I could kick something off from in front of my car. Right. And, of course, it makes people hysterical. Yeah. And then they proceed to demonstrate just how elaborate the discourse of football is. Uh -huh. So I tell my students, whenever anyone accuses you of overthinking something, just think about what USers do with sports. Mm -hmm. That's an example of... I wouldn't call it overthinking, but I would think of it as an example of really complicated thinking that goes on in a few minutes. And is that a public discourse? Is that what you would yes. call that? Yeah. It's a, you could think of football or food or cancer or medical treatments as social text. Now, if a text is a collection of signs, of words, images, of sounds, photographs, then a social text is a collection of signs extended in terms of our attention to where it comes out of the social order. So we look at any coherent or even not so coherent collection or combination of all the things that are out there and available for us, and we turn them into the object of our analysis, the object of our interpretation. So simply by asking someone, as you all did, mm -hmm. what do you know about? 
you've already invited them from their different places in the social order to participate in a discussion that's going to take us to discourse. So tell me again, what, what is a social text? I don't think I quite caught It's a collection or combination of signs, of events, of phenomenon mm -hmm. that go on within our broad social order and they become texts by virtue of our scrutiny of them. When we start to think about them, so Obama, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. He's a social text, first by virtue of being the head of state, the president, and then he's increasingly and even more elaborately a social text as we decide how we're gonna respond to him. So when people respond to him with hope, because they have an understanding of US racial history, or when they respond to him with cynicism because they're unhappy about a racial history that has produced him as the president in this present moment, then he himself and everything he stands for are being subjected to scrutiny. Lots of different discourses come into it. Militarism, parenting, because he has two daughters. Fashion, what's he wearing when he's on the golf course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's another social text that I'm thinking of mm -hmm. that um, I'd like for you to talk about. This is the 20th anniversary of the Anita Hill hearings, oh, yeah. where she testified mm -hmm. uh, in front of the Senate um, on, on the confirmation of Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. And you've written quite a bit about this mm -hmm. in terms of class and gender yeah. and affirmative action. Mm -hmm. um, how, how would you use literature yeah. to kind of unravel this social text? Yeah. And actually, you know, what I would do would be a combination. And actually what I'd Done. It's a combination of literary close reading, but also semiotics. And semiotics is a study of signs, including more than non than verbal signs. So right? images, for images, example. Right. So we have That's, an image of okay. uh, Clarence Thomas with okay. um, President Bush, okay. first Bush, and then also with Senator Danforth at the okay. hearing. So looking at right. these images. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, what, what, okay. what comes to mind? This one is, both of them are fascinating, but they're fascinating in two different ways. The first one where he's sitting with Bush, uh -huh. it's early on in the discussion, right? So there we have U.S. power on display. Bush is not just there next to him, but he's in the foreground, and he's leaning forward. Mm. So it, you can see the mantle of the power hmm. of the head of state mm -hmm. bringing Clarence Thomas into view, in, to our attention. When he's with Danforth, that's, that's much further on during the hearings where the challenge has been made, where the scandal, the controversy around Anita Hill has surfaced, yeah. where he's been talking to the media and at one point he talks about the theater of suffering. Well, the media, the print media especially, they then start changing the figurations of him. So President Bush is no longer at his side, mm -hmm. but another powerful marker, Senator Danford, is there in the picture. Clarence Thomas is looking down. Mm -hmm. Danford is putting his hand and his arm around him, and he's consoling him. So then Clarence Thomas becomes this figure that we're invited to sympathize with, this man at the center of pain. Now, what we don't think about and what my students didn't think about, mm -hmm. but what became more apparent as we talked about, this is not a lonely, suffering figure. This is a man who has been in the presence and knows the president. This is a man who's friends with a really powerful senator. So there's power all around him. And he is in a discourse of None power. of this is intentional. This is just what we it, see as the public. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be intentional. You know, whether you know, people want to argue about, well, he's being framed in a certain way or not. And sometimes I would argue, yes, he is mm -hmm. being framed. So mm -hmm. that is intentional. On the other hand, it doesn't have to be intentional because there are certain ways that we already know how to receive images. There are certain ways that we respond to photographs. So having him presented as a lonely figure walking across the White House lawn is fascinating. That's not one of the pictures we looked at, mm -hmm. but it was a picture that was repeated in newspapers all over the country. Mm -hmm. So he's a lonely figure walking across the White House lawn. There's no such thing as a lonely figure walking across the White House lawn. <laughs> to be walking across yeah. the White House lawn, there's already a complicated set of operations that are already in effect, sure, right? Sure. But what the photograph does is encourage us to see him out of context, mm -hmm. to simply see him as this almost mythic, singular 
lonely figure. Mm -hmm. What I do with my students then is encourage them to read back the context, the complexity mm -hmm. of all of these discussions, all of these discourses, into a photograph that has trained us to not think about those things. Right. Mm -hmm. So with with Clarence Thomas, uh, this being 20 years since mm -hmm. Anita Hill gave that, mm -hmm. is there anything else you'd like to talk about in terms of um, black women and agency right. and and Anita Hill and how we regard yeah. her this day? And I would love to have us go back and look at some of the issues that were raised and dismissed or addressed you know, in really simple-minded fashion. Like I remember people talking about they didn't know this woman. And I argued that you didn't know her because her class standing made her imperceptible. Like you mean they didn't know of her before? They didn't know of her. They yeah. didn't really know what she was. Right. And I would say you could only say that if you don't know anything about black law professors, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Or if you don't know anything about a law school curriculum that produces someone. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had a conversation with someone recently about Obama who said he's truly exceptional. And I said, well, in one way, yeah, he's the president of the United States, but I know hundreds and thousands of people who have had elite educations, who have traveled widely, mm -hmm. who are wonderfully poised, articulate, capable of on-the-spot analysis. Mm -hmm. If he's exceptional, in some part it's because his class standing and his class background pulls him out of the common herd. Mm -hmm. So when Anita Hill makes her appearance, and whatever she is in terms of politics, she is in that moment an anomaly in terms of the reception of her appearance and her, her sound and her story. So there were people who simply didn't know what to make of that. She's so singular that she didn't make sense to them. Yeah, it seems like people didn't really know um, right. about uh, uh, black professionals yeah. outside of the Cosby Show. The Cosby right. Show was big back right. then. Exactly. And that's the only time they knew exactly. of a black female lawyer. Yeah. So in this moment, I, I would talk to my students if we were to come to this later on in the semester about what it means from this vantage point to go back to some of the criticism, some of the nastiness that was aimed at her and to unpack it with the difference that 20 years may have made. Yeah. Well, speaking of black women, you brought a photo here um, that I'll show. Um, and t Tell me what this photo is of. Okay. This is a black women's drill team. This photograph goes back to 1905. The drill teams have been around in the United States and especially in black communities or the black sections of town. It's been around... Oh, it's been around for decades before that. And the reason I was interested in the photograph and I bought it and put it on my wall is because I was spending a lot of time in the classroom talking about drill teams. My students wanted to know why was it that I was fascinated with drill teams. Okay, I've already said I'm a cultural studies scholar. I'm interested in the production of meaning. I'm interested in everyday life. So I told my students, here's an example of a whole range of complexity. We saw what they were dressed in, right? One of the things that drill teams represent is a response to the military, whether it's a response in the early part of the 20th century to black exclusion from participation in the military, or later on in the century, where it's a response to what black people know by virtue of the, the almost disproportionate numbers of black males and black women in the military. But it's also a response to segregated schools, right, where black people weren't in the high school marching bands. And then it's a response to what it means to have that change over time. But my students, they're interested in that, but they want to press further. And I said, well, think about it. When you're on a drill team, especially in these, these small town community drill teams or small suburban drill teams, you know, the suburbs, the, the black suburbs around Washington, D.C., the primary, the thing that's of primary importance is your ability to dance, to march in syncopation. Mm -hmm. But it's not just march in syncopation, it's your ability to march in syncopation and then break up mm -hmm. the, the rows, the columns, right? So you're not just moving along a grid, they thin themselves out into a line, they circle around. So 
if we're thinking about bus schedules, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, what do you need to know to make sense of a drill team? Mm -hmm. You already know that groups of people march in columns. Well, in order to appreciate the drill team, you have to know that and appreciate the fact that the drill team is deviating from that. So then my students start thinking about what it means. Oh, so these are black girls in their communities because I'm most interested in the women's and the girls' drill teams. They don't have to look a certain way. They don't have to have weaves. I mean, they could. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be elaborately made up. They could be. Mm -hmm. But they can be a whole range of things and be valued for their participation in the drill teams. So here you have a chance to see everyday culture and the aesthetics of everyday culture being made by everyday people. My younger sister was part of the drill team when I was a teenager. I couldn't get onto the drill team because I didn't dance uh -huh, as well. Uh -huh. But then the drill team also becomes another space for community making, including, including politics. Yeah. So in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, the drill team and the women, the girls who participated in it, were also going through the civil rights movement and the black power movement mm -hmm. when Angela Davis was arrested. And in many towns, cities around the country, people put together contributions to the Angela Davis Defense Fund. Well, the young girls who were in the New Kensington drill team at that time were in competition with the Girl Scouts and the Brownies over who was going to be most visible and most loud wow. in participation yeah. in the defense of Angela Davis. Wow, and you don't hear about this yes. at all. But the people who are there know it, right. but we don't mm -hmm. hear about it if it's not in the media and if scholars aren't working with this. Well, now there are scholars who are working on Drill Team. There's a video that someone put together, I cannot remember her name right now, but it's entitled, Tell Them Who We Were. Right? Huh. And she put together a documentary on this particular drill team. So the drill team then opens us up to a whole world of discourse. Well, it's funny be that you mentioned the media, and, and we didn't discuss this before, <laughs> so I don't know if you've been following these Occupy Wall Street oh, protests. Not oh. only have I been. Oh, look, you have a book. Yes. What's in there? It's actually my folio. Oh, really? And I made a sign. You know, I'm sitting up all night long preparing for class one day. I just sat there and I made a sign. Oh. I heart Occupy Wall Street. I can't believe what's going on. And talk yeah. about the layers and levels yes. of meanings behind that. Right. What, what are you making of this? What would literature make well, of this? It's, it's, and actually, the reason I think I keep coming back to cultural studies is because it's a way for us to imagine how the toolkit that comes together in cultural studies projects help us, and that includes literary theory and literary close reading, but it also includes attention to political history, to the political economy, to the history of movements. And one, of the, one of the organizers of Occupy Wall Street is a cultural anthropologist named David Graeber. And a couple of years ago, I used an essay that he wrote about the protest, the WTO protest in Seattle, and the big puppets that people put together. And he wrote an incredible essay. The big, pu pu the big puppets. Those oh, the puppets, huge, yeah. Huge, huge, huge. Yeah. He did an essay where he talked about puppet building as a way of understanding political organizing, but he also talked about the response of the police to the puppets. They hate the puppets. Uh -huh. And media people hate the puppets. They think they're hokey. Uh -huh. They think they don't understand. This isn't serious. Uh -huh. And in fact, what's fascinating for me about Occupy Wall Street is that Graeber and you know, thousands of other people who are part of this are literally making protest culture on the ground. So it's a social text. And then we can think about what it means to have that as the object of our scrutiny. Does that make sense in response to your question? Yes, it, it, it does. And it's, um, it's something that I know a lot of people mm -hmm. have been paying attention to lately. Mm -hmm. And I also know that um, uh, the world was kind of shaken overnight last night with the death of yeah. Steve, Steve Jobs and, yeah. and um, what that means for Apple and what that yes. means for our society right. and our um, uh, connection to technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is there something that literature could make out with that? Yeah, there's a, there's a way that, that literary studies, for example, 
teaches us to pay attention to a text, right? And the text can be the announcement of his death. It can be the way the announcement of his death ran online, at blogs, at websites. It can take, give the comments. The comments themselves are a social text, a, a written response from lots of people who may not know each other but who are getting together in a collective kind of mourning. But it also opens up into a discourse of American innovation, and I say American innovation because one of the responses of Obama to it was to talk about him as an innovator, right? So you can you can go online and you can see people arguing about, well, what does it mean to call him an innovator? And what does that say about this moment? And do we want to say that, do we want innovation to rest solely in the figure of an individual because no interv the innovator lives in the world without connections to all the things that make that innovation, innovation possible, including education, right? A general public good produces the ability of someone to think, to pull together the resources. So in a way, the whole social text of U.S. investment in infrastructure mm -hmm. literally comes into view. And you, in the moment when it's happening, People may not necessarily go online and say, now I'm contributing to a discourse around U.S. educational infrastructure. Right, right, no, right. it comes out when you stop, you look at the moment, and you, you subject it to a scrutiny, to a critical understanding, a critical analysis, and interpretation. Now, what will happen in the next week will be some places will then produce a meta-commentary on the commentary, right? So someone will look back and say, here's what seems to have been happening in that moment. Mm -hmm. And my students are fascinated because they say, oh, oh, okay, so now we're moving from subjecting that particular social text to scrutiny to subjecting the scrutiny to scrutiny. Oh, okay, and that's yeah. what you mean by meta-commentary. Yes. Yes. So what about, we had talked about this, uh, people in, in the comment section mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. uh, when they write, when they're just in the moment and they're responding mm -hmm. to some text, right. um, and they just respond online yeah. uh, quickly in the comment section, right. well, what does literature make of, of that act right there? It makes, of, it makes of that as an act of, let's say, let's say we can think of it as an act of a spontaneous text production from that individual. But the long context that makes that spontaneous act possible mm -hmm. is something, something that we can think about. So it's not just the comment from this individual. Mm -hmm. It's the media. It, it's the medium itself, right? The internet. And is it that individual bringing everything that they have everything to that bear they on have, that But topic. also the things that they don't even know that they have. Uh. Okay, uh -huh. a skill that they don't even know that they have, right. an experience, a whole world of being immersed in the present that doesn't necessarily remind them that the present began a long time ago. Okay. Just a reminder, if you're just tuning in, we are here with Professor Juanima Lubiano, and you're invited to send in questions by email to live at duke.edu, or you can tweet your question using the hashtag DukeLive, or you can post your question on Duke University's Facebook page. Now, Anima, you have um, an exercise that I thought was very interesting mm -hmm. that you use in your intro to oh, African American yeah. Studies yes. class. Oh yeah, I love it. Yeah, I I brought it with me. I brought it with me because I wanted to be able to to show you. And I don't know. I don't know how easy this is to yeah. see. Yeah. So let me just tell you. Yeah, maybe you could just talk us through or just what explain. I did it was one day in class. Because we were reading a chapter from the history of Chicago intellectuals written by a man named Devarian Baldwin, and we were reading a chapter on Madam C.J. Walker, who is cre uh, commonly known as the person who invented the straightening comb for black hair. And the chapter is really interesting because, of course, it talks about her beginnings. It talks about the empire that she built around this hair technology. It talks about her emergence as a figure of cultural power and political power because she used a lot of the money that she made to underwrite uh, people who were engaged in different kinds of political organizing. So when we're looking at this chapter, my, one of my students said, well, I know that this is important to think about, but hair? I mean, 
hair is kind of simple, isn't it? Right. So I said, okay, we're going to go around the room. Everybody say one thing about hair, just whatever you want, straight off the top of your head, and I'm going to put it up on the board. So, you know, they said everything from I don't like naturals to hair is expensive to my mother thinks she owns my hair to my sister doesn't want to go to college. She wants to go to beauty school and work on hair, and my mother hates that. And after I put all these these responses, and I think I, the time I did this the last time, I had maybe 32 students in the classroom, I organized them so that we could think about what those responses meant. So we could think about hair in the everyday sense, right? The way it, it situates you in a family context. So there's the history of your family, including your mother and your father. It's about aesthetics, beauty, and style. But as you all already pointing out, it's about technology, right? Hair is one of the places where we can see technology at work in the everyday. But there's also the educational institutions, beauty schools, that produce this. There's Madam C.J. Walker herself and her contribution to political education by virtue of what she funded what she supported. There are the questions about gender and sexuality. If you care about yourself and you're a woman, shouldn't your hair look a certain way? Right. There, the, there's a way that hair opens us up to a discourse around markets. There, there's a way that hair talks about social positioning. So people in different class locations, you can look at and you can see the class and the lack of access yeah. or the access, extraordinary access. Hair is so political it's and it's so loaded. Yeah. And so through literature, we could take something mm -hmm. as mundane mm -hmm. and seeming mm -hmm. as that and just unravel it into all of these. We could do it in the literature program yeah. because that's part of the way the literature program organizes itself. There's a whole world of text And you out mean the there. literature program at Duke? The literature program at Duke. Okay. Um, theory programs, mm -hmm. people who work with different forms of theory, mm -hmm. people who work with different forms of cultural studies projects. Mm -hmm. So it is not, it is, thinking about hair this way is making hair a text and then subjecting it to the kind of scrutiny I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's different from reading a novel, right? right? So some of what I'm thinking about is a form of insisting on the way the literature program at Duke, the way that cultural studies generally, the way that African and African American studies calls onto the table a multiplicity of discourses mm -hmm. to deal with a multiplicity of objects. Right. But you say the literature program, some people, some of your colleagues do work with books and poems right. some, and yep. plays. And, and actually, I do sometimes. Okay. Too. okay. <laughs> I do. And, but what I find interesting about the literature program, what I find interesting about African and African American studies and cultural studies is that the notion of a text opens up. Right. Mm -hmm. I like working with novels. I'm a Toni Morrison scholar, mm -hmm. but I'm also as fascinated by hair as I am by beloved. Ah, okay. Well, we have one last question mm -hmm. here today. It's from uh, Professor Carla Holloway, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry I didn't know this, but Derek Bell passed away. Oh, I didn't know. That. Yeah, we. I didn't know either. But oh. she's asking if you um, have some response to that, or I mean, I can look at your face and see oh. your response. But um, uh, he was no. an influential scholar in my life, and I'm sure yeah. countless others. It, you know, he's amazing. I mean, all right, he's a law professor, but he's also a political activist. He's an amazing, he was an amazing, I keep saying is yeah, because yeah. he hasn't yet completely died for me. Yeah. He's an amazing storyteller. He produced a, an enormous body of important work. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful support for the founding of critical race theory in law curricula. He supported... He supported all manner of scholars who were working in the field of race studies. Mm. When I put together the anthology, I edited The House That Race Built, he was gracious enough. I just wrote to him and I said, I'm a fan. I've been following your work forever. Yeah. Would you blurb my book? And I wrote a lot, since I always talk a lot, uh -huh. about it, things I had gotten from him. And he wrote back and he said, well, I wish I could put you on my payroll <laughs> to talk about my corpus of work. Right. But he agreed to, blog, to blurb the book. Yeah. It, wow. Yeah. It's, you know, it's always devastating when 
these figures who are both important in and of themselves as figures, but they're also important because they're a nexus of different kinds of intellectual and political activity. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about a black intelligentsia, for example, we sometimes pay attention to the individuals, but someone like Derry Bell is like, He's, he's like someone who built an infrastructure yeah. for a generation of black intellectuals. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Office Hours. Sure. It's been a provocative discussion about literature mm -hmm. and how it can be used in everyday life. Please tune in next week at Thursday at noon for the next issue episode of Office Hours.